This is Support is Sexy, episode 58, with Levine Intervention host, Abby Levine. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I am thrilled to have you here because you know it just would not be the same without you. So today we are welcoming my friend, Abby Levine. And Abby is the host of the podcast, Levine Intervention. And she has also been in the field of media and television production mainly, but also in film for 20 years. And in this episode, she talks about the transition from being behind the camera, behind the scenes to moving in front with her podcast and doing some on-camera things. Totally get it. I feel like we're the same person. We talk about that. But one of the things that Abby talks about during our interview that I really love and had so much fun doing is the power of surrender. So I want you to listen to that theme throughout this episode of her just talking about her own journey with surrender, how she began to tap into its power and how it has done magnificent things in her life and in her career. So what you'll learn on this episode, uh, in addition to the power of surrender, is the importance of training people to properly support you. You know, we're all about support. So we talked a little bit about that. The smart reasons that you should delegate and surrender things that don't turn you on, as Abby says. Also, what you can learn in times of crisis and how to move through those times. How to know when your calling is telling you that it's time for a change. I think that's very important. Abby and I also talked about getting over imposter syndrome. If you don't know what that is, listen to this episode. And I also have a link in the show notes to an article that talks more about imposter syndrome, which is something a lot of us as entrepreneurs, creatives, or achievers face every once in a while. And Abby also talks about allowing yourself to go big. I think that's so important because a lot of us get caught in this thing where we tend to play it small because playing it small is safe and the ego wants us to stay small in some ways because it protects us as I've talked about before. But Abby talked about for her, the importance of going big, knowing that she is meant to go big. And for all of us, I think we can take some lesson from that. So we had a lot of fun in this episode. I really hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, Abby Levine. So, Abby, thank you so much for joining us on an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. Elaine Fluker, I feel <laughs> like I am getting interviewed by a celebrity. And <laughs> I cleared my whole schedule <laughs> to make time for this. It's very important. Thank you. Yeah, you cleared your whole day for our hour long interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. Okay, I have to ask you the first question I ask everyone. When did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Oh, my gosh. I was about eight years old, um, and I went to Hebrew school um, on Sundays, and then after um, that, I would go to my friend Jill Feldman's house, and my first business was a sticker business. We would sit and create the stickers in her living room, and her mom would bring us, like, lunch, Mm -hmm. and then we would take a break and play Atari. And then go back to building our business, listening to records in Jill's living room. Um, and we had, I had a whole portfor- portfolio of stickers that um, we sold. Um, so, I mean, I've literally always been a business person. <laughs> Since you were eight years old. Now, was that your idea or Jill's idea? The sticker uh, business? I can't say I remember, but I, knowing me, Um, I'm usually the idea person and then whoever I can pull in to help me, um, and is a willing participant. I mean, people that know me well sort of laugh about that. I have collaborators like all over the world, um, for, for all of my projects. Um, and you know, Jill and I made some money, um, on that. And I think that we turned it into, um, what do we turn it into like a bracelet business after that? <laughs> you know, Jill and I were in business, you know, for a little while, actually. Yeah. Now, where did you grow up? I grew up in Connecticut. 
Um, I, um, I'm the oldest of four kids and I kind of, I grew up in, um, I grew up in a middle class, um, town, but my parents were both, you know, they wanted to give us this really bright, beautiful life, but they, but there was always financial problems too. Right. So I think I, 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 you know, we had it, we had it fine. Mm -hmm. We had it fine, but I always aspired to be able to, um, take care of myself and others. Um, so I kind of just learned to hustle at, at, at an early age. <laughs> Which is in you. Yeah. Now, yeah. What, what was, other than a hustler, what was um, Abby like as a little girl? Um, <laughs> I've always been friends with everyone. Um, like if you, if I had to put myself in, um, in a, in a category like I was sort of the most liked by all in high school kind of girl so I rode crew um I've always been a jock so I rode crew that's like on a boat mm -hmm. you know and I was the, the stroke which is the person that sets the pace for the boat <laughs> mm -hmm. um but because you're also, a leader uh, because I'm a leader because and I, leader. Re I recently remembered this that I was the stroke for my crew team. And I thought, wow, cause I don't think of myself as somebody that has a ton of beat and rhythm, but now that I teach spinning, <laughs> I have to catch, I have to like kind of t tune into it. So yeah, the, um, I, I, I rode crew, but I was also really good friends with the chill people, like the, like the deadheads, even though I never really like belonged in that group. Um, there was no real like hippie, entrepreneurial, funky, bohemian group. So I, I gravitated towards the deadheads. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Now, what were the deadheads like? Were those like the punk rock people or? No, I was a really awkward kid, actually. I, I didn't come into my own self-confidence or physical confidence until I was probably 30. Oh, wow. Yeah, late late I did, had no idea how to do my hair or how to dress or you know I or I was always a little overweight um and, and I didn't know how to do my makeup like all the girly things that <clears throat> comes with being a, a kid and a woman that didn't get to me until I was about 30 I'm a super late bloomer in everything I do mm -hmm. e everything like decades sometimes later than everybody else so I don't judge it but the deadheads were – the reason I was I hung out with those kids was because um, um, they were easygoing. They were easygoing. You know, uh, to be honest with you, that group probably wasn't the best, most influential group on me. But I think they were the easiest to hang out with, which is an interesting lesson, right? My best friend across the street was a deadhead. And so she kind of brought me into this group. And I just never really made an effort to – spend a ton of time with other people. It's interesting talking about this because I haven't thought about this before, right, right? right? But I didn't really follow my own path in and make my own decisions like that as a kid. You know what I mean? I went with what came in front of me. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I probably more belonged with the... I wasn't cool enough to be like cheerleader group. Um, and I wasn't like the prom queenie kind of that group either. I wasn't... I was friends with all the popular kids, but I wasn't you weren't a in popular their kid. I right. wasn't an in kid. I, I can't, I don't like all that. Right. Like I don't like all that. I was more, um, I was somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of, um, I was trying to put myself in a breakfast club category, but I don't really fit <laughs> in any of those either. Like that's why that movie's so brilliant because yes. it's like, that's we're all, all the a little misfits. bit of all of those yeah yeah exactly <laughs> I love it now who were some of your um, greatest influences growing up you said you were a late bloomer were there any was there anyone you looked up to though during that time my influences have more come later in life um I had I had a little bit of a chaotic childhood mm -hmm. um you know so I would say after college I started to get more professional and personal influencers. Um, there is one person who influenced me a lot growing up and that's my aunt. Um, and she was very, she created a very safe home environment and her family, her core family is very important to her. And I've always had held those values, but never quite found them. 
um, in my own journey yet. 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 Um, so I would say my aunt held that space for me really, really well um, as, a, as a kid. Um, and then are you asking more for personal or professional? Either one. I'm just interested. I'm always interested to hear how people, one, I, I love hearing, I ask these questions about childhood and growing up because it's so interesting too to hear and for me to watch people go back and think about those things that influence them. But yeah. then it, it usually is also an indication of where they are now. Um, it's just interesting to make that connection. So to answer your question, either personal or professional. Yeah, interesting. Because I was, yeah, it's funny because Part of my entrepreneurship also is um, at the core level, like being a survivor, mm. right? And like like knowing that I'm going to pave my own path and also being a bit of a rebel. I, I, I've never really fit into somebody else's structure. I sort of, I sort of try. I've had moments in my career where I've tried to. And I just spit it back. (laughs) Tell us about that. What do you mean that it's sort of your survival and as a rebel for you as an entrepreneur? Um, I think in order to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to constantly create, like be in a constant state of creation a constant state of evolution and a constant state of rebound almost is the word that comes to mind as I'm saying that because, and love, right? You have to be in a constant state of love because if you're not like fully in love with what you're doing, it's going to fade away because it takes such persistence and such determination and such so many no's to get to a yes that, being an entrepreneur is is only mentally and and emotionally and and financially successful if you can put that that puzzle together right for me right so there's just so many pieces of it um and so the rebel in me i don't know like i don't always know if this is a good thing because i sort of reject a lot of other people's paths for making for creation so I I create content um and I've created content for other people for a long long time um and you know I thought about this um when I knew that I was coming on like well what am I what am I here like talking about like who am I as an entrepreneur because there's a because there's a lot of different things that I create and right now I'm creating it's just like, it's really the brand is, is me, you know? So I've been creating television shows for other people for a really long time. And now I'm flipping it so that I'm creating my own. I have my own podcast now that you were on. Yes, I'm thinking about opening my own spin studio and I have my own nonprofit. So the two things that are in existence now are the nonprofit and my brand, which is called Levine Intervention. And I'm sure that we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. But in order to put all those together, you know, <laughs> I've actually had to, my rebel has had to almost surrender a little bit. And in doing that, she has gotten what she's she wants. So in what ways has the rebel in you had to surrender? My rebel has had to surrender. Okay, interestingly enough, my rebel has had to realize that she can't do it all alone. Aha. Uh-huh. Yes. There you go. Support. Yes. yes. So that is why this, what you're doing it, to me is so important for people to listen to and to give people so many different flavors of support because I've dipped my toe in this arena literally for the last 20 years, Elaine, you know, like I've said, okay, no, no, now I'm going to get support. Okay, no, 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 now, no, really, someone's going to, because you have to take a leap of faith. You have to trust somebody. Yeah. You have to pay them in a business setup. You have to believe that your money is valuable, is going to become something valuable for you. And, you know, there's so much that goes into, it's like, it's like my rebel has been like so tightly hanging on to like all these things that I've been creating for so long and I can do it on my own and uh, 
And now she's just like, okay, you gave birth. Mm -hmm. Now hire somebody to help you take care of it. Exactly. You know? I think that's the thing. It's like it, for most of us as entrepreneurs and creators, it feels like our baby and you just, it's difficult to bring someone in. You don't think anyone else can do it like you, or, you know, like you said, I'll bring someone in later. Okay. Later. Okay. Later. And you just have to come to that point where you surrender to someone that you trust. Yes. And also realizing that I mean, this is part of my journey. I don't know. I don't know about other entrepreneurs for this, but for me, what I've had, what I've really had to find is my voice mm. in training people properly, because sometimes there's part of the process that I just don't want to deal with. Like I absolutely do not like dealing with my books. I just don't, I, I don't, I love the, the financial part of it. And, and that is, it's a huge turn on for me, but, but sitting down and calculating it all. So I hired a bookkeeper probably 10 years ago now. Mm. And she has been, she, she's a very good friend of mine. So, but even sitting down to prepare the paperwork for her, I have to like literally take a bath, put on music, put on a candle, like get myself <laughs> in a super sexy place to deal with just the, the, that part of it because it's not a turn on for me. Right. You know, but I've learned to surrender and teach people on the creative on the creative sense. When something used to go wrong, like I'll give you a very perfect example. <laughs> this week, I so I turned my podcast over to a producer to book. And on Monday, I said, "Okay, like who do we have on tomorrow's podcast?" And she was like, "Oh my god, I didn't confirm anybody." You know, and I like old me would have like it, the surrender of it old me would have like held on tightly like oh my god how did she do this she's incapable like I would have made like this huge fuss out of it in my head and probably to her also and made her feel bad because she wasn't perfect mm -hmm. and this week I said okay you know it's like I was thinking like okay it's a good learning experience for her like I just I I I I tried to train her in a way that's like, okay, we have to get ahead of this. We have to put people on the map. Like, you know, and this is why it's important. And then, you know, things just change. I think that's a big, big part of being an entrepreneur. Also, this is a newer lesson for me, but, um, it's like the puzzle pieces are always moving. moving yes. They're always moving. And you, if you are grasping and holding on tightly, then, oh, yeah, your hands are going to get bloody. <laughs> exactly. That's right. <laughs> Being able to let go. So how did you, in the, in the instance that you mentioned with your producer, in what ways did you move through that? I mean, you know, did you decide, okay, we'll just figure it out? Or what, what was your way of getting through I gave her something a task. like that that could have been a crisis to some people? Yeah, I gave her a task. I basically said, okay, you know, try she happened to book something for me something else on another show I was working on a show I was working on last week she found super pleasure in doing this task of trying to find and an, um she, we were casting a tv show so she she put out a casting call and she was like oh my god this is so fun I'm making people's dreams come true so I tapped into that fun and I just said okay like you know you have until three o'clock and I gave her a topic to look for um, because my podcast is um people coming on and asking questions mm -hmm. that I answer. So rather than the the usual way we do it is approach people and say, What kind of a question would you have for Abby? So I thought it might be easier if she had, Does anybody have this question? Right. Right. Then people just have to come. So I gave her that and I gave her a time frame. And then I just surrendered. And I was like, if it happens, it happens. And you know what happened? It happened. It did not happen, ah. and I was needed somewhere else that night. That's right. what happened. I had a I had a different I had I had a different calling that night. I, mm -hmm. I had a different my my other one of my other projects needed a little more love that night, and I was able to give it. So maybe that was the universe's way of clearing some space for you <clears throat> to be able to do that. 
Yeah. That's what happened. That's, That's what, what happened. happens. I think it's what you said too. I'm just it, reflecting on it in my own life, business, et cetera. This idea of holding on to things so tightly, your hands will get bloody. I just yeah. think it's so that's such a, an interesting analogy because that's true. We just want to I think because that it's really for some people it might be control, but for others of us, it might be just you just want it to work so badly and you're trying to make it work. But sometimes you're really trying to force something through that could go through in a way that's more gentle. Like yeah, you your experience. Now, what drew you to media at first? Where did you go to school? You mentioned college earlier. I actually studied television production, television, radio, and film production. Uh, I went to Syracuse University okay. um, up in upstate New York. And, and actually, I, I transferred there. I, I started at the University of Miami. Um, and I they had a great communications program, actually. Mm-hmm. But then I realized almost three years in that when I graduated – and this was the entrepreneur in me totally. I was this was a loud and clear message actually. I didn't love Miami as a place and I realized that when I graduated from University of Miami I would n- people don't really take that school too seriously outside of Florida and I said I'm going to have to work in Miami with this degree not have to but I felt like my best chance would be in Miami mm. if I stayed there and so I got out of Dodge man I said <laughs> I, I gotta flip this and um you know I really actually did a 180 like I went from Miami to upstate New York and Syracuse and um I really only spent two years there but my all of my best contacts um, are from from Syracuse University, and actually, I've been talking about going back and teaching there. Mm, I would love to do. Yeah, that's a great idea. Now, did you go to Syracuse because of the television and broadcast program? Is that what you knew? You always knew that's something that you wanted to go into, as far as media. Yes, I did. Um, I I was lucky enough to connect. So the universe set it up for me so that it was very easy. Um, for me, because I went out to UCLA to visit the school when I was 16. And my uncle who lived there took me to see a taping of win, lose or draw. It was a game show back then. Mm -hmm. And I just sat in the audience and I was mesmerized by the production. And I said, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And I knew since I was 16 and I was in that moment that, that I wanted to be in television production. Now, to be fair, I'm not in love with television production That's anymore. That's funny. That was one of my questions. Do you, do you love it or did you love it? I loved it for a long time, but my calling is bigger than being behind the scenes. I've, I've, I've gained a vast, vast, vast um, amount of knowledge as a producer and how to tell a story and how to make moments happen and how to, I mean the list that we could talk, that's a whole nother podcast, right? Like, like how you've been many, a producer for what? 16 years or so. 21 years, 21 20, years. Oh, you're like 21 years, 20 years in the game. 20 and you years. Were, yeah. You were a producer on love and hip hop and you've done things like work with Lady Gaga and you've done a wide range of, of content, as you said. So you've done it a little bit of it all. I ended up coming, I ended up, um, yeah, I just want to finish the, the university story for one second, because what happened was, When I decided I was going to transfer to Syracuse, well, the universe decided I was going to transfer to Syracuse because I went up to see Ithaca and my mother said, you should go see Syracuse. And I said, I don't want to go to Syracuse. And she drove me to Syracuse. And when I went onto the campus, I walked into the School of Communications and I just said, is there anybody here that I can talk to? And they led me into the room of the most brilliant television professor on the planet his name's robert thompson and he dissects television the way that people look at shakespeare and his mind was like so incredible i'm fascinated with this guy still um and i said okay yeah this is where i need to be Mm -hmm. and so that you know i think that you kind of you have to you have these moments right where i was just guided there and um you know and it happened So anyway, I interned at Good Morning America when I was in college. And then when I graduated, um, I, sort of a long story, but I was led out to L.A. This was in 1995 that I graduated college, so there was no internet. So I was sitting in my house, like, looking through the back of, like, broadcasting cable magazine, 
trying to apply to jobs by writing a letter. And it was really hard and really frustrating. Like I actually just stayed in Syracuse and bartended mm-hmm. <laughs> for like six months until a really good friend of mine dragged me kicking and screaming to LA to her brother's wedding. And I'm so grateful to her t- to this day. Gosh, telling these stories, I really have had a lot of angels throughout this whole process. It's oh, really, see? really interesting. Um, and we were still back 21 years ago. I mean, so, um, so I ended up at the same uncle's couch and, um, I dropped my resume off at a bunch of different studios trying to get work. Nothing came through. And then I was in my pleasure and went to go see a taping of the price is right. So back in the game shows, right? So my first reason for getting into TV was game sh- was win, lose, or draw. Then I went to go see Price is Right as a contestant, and I dropped off my resume, and I got a job for $6 an hour writing name tags on the Price is Right and answering the phone wow. on the set of Young and the Restless. <laughs> <laughs> and that was your first job in media? That was my first, first job in media. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Oh, I was in heaven. You loved I was, it. I was in heaven. I was Six broke as hour. a skunk. I mean, oh my God, I was so broke. I mean, I was so broke. I was eating, I mean, I remember eating like cans of chili for dinner. Like I know my expenses exactly from back then, <laughs> what my car payment was, what my rent was, and exactly how much I had left over a week. And it is a miracle that I survived. <laughs> now, how long did you do that before you moved on to something else? Because that obviously is the start, but in media, how long did you go through that period and... Well, this is the thing about me. It takes me a long time. So I, I, I've, and this is what, this is what I tell people, um, kids and entrepreneurs and anybody getting into media. I mean, really on air or as a producer or people that want to set their own path. I have, I have probably had 50 to 60 jobs in my lifetime. I have moved around so much because you have to constantly be w- pulled. So for a long time, for the last two decades, I've been pulled to to rise in the entertainment industry as a producer. So one door closes, I just you just go in another direction. You just keep moving and moving and moving. And I and one of my favorite jobs after that page job as a, as a young kid was I worked on Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher. Mm. Um, and I was I answered the phones. And then I was the assistant to the senior producer. And God love everybody who I was an assistant to. I was a horrible assistant. I, <laughs> I really was. You talk about support is sexy. Like, I mean, I tried. I did try, but getting lunch and like sitting and waiting for tasks to do, oh, it just didn't work for you. Oh, it made me so uncomfortable, like waiting for stuff to do, you know? Um, So were you one of those people? I was like that as an intern and even an assistant. Were you one of those people that's always like, what else can I do? Is there anything else as far as looking for something to help you move ahead? Always. Yeah, always. I mean, I have just always had to stay busy. People, people tell me now. Like right now, I teach spinning, run a nonprofit, have a podcast. I'm running three TV shows and developing one, and I have an active dating life. And I don't even feel tired. Right. Like, You're looking like, what else can I do? I'm, I'm full at the moment. Like, that's good. I'm good. Like, I'm tapped out. Although every time I get a new job offer, like yesterday, another offer, things are blossoming for mm-hmm. me, right, as in different areas. And every time, yeah, man, this is it. Right. Like this is where I think the entrepreneurial spirit is like every time an opportunity comes in, I'm like, woohoo, woohoo, woohoo. Like I get excited about something new coming in. Um, Like even just if it's just like, oh, I get to sub a spin class. Mm -hmm. So I get to add a class. Right. Or I get to um, like the film I'm working on as a director. They've been putting me on camera. I'm like the face of the campaign. And they added a weekend for me to go and do something else for the film in the middle of my post-production for this other project I'm working on this TV show. And I actually like came up with how I could fit that in for a weekend. Cause mm-hmm. I'm going to be in Virginia and I'm like, well, yeah, it's my birthday weekend and you want to fly me to LA. I'll work for five hours, have dinner with my friends. And then like, fly back on Sunday and be back in the edit bay at 10 a.m. on Monday. And I'm like, 
that hustle gets me so excited. Like, right. yeah, let's make this work. Now let's talk about the transition, like you said, from being behind the camera into doing, being more on the camera and doing sort of elevating in media and doing bigger things that you're called to do now. When did that moment come for you where you felt like I need to make a move in front of the camera or not even just in front of the camera doing things like your podcast, Levine Intervention, which I love. When did Thank you decide you. To, to make those kinds of transitions. And you were amazing on my podcast. Oh, Elaine. Thank you. so good. And everything so you've done fun. to support it has been incredible also. So I want to say thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, this is where the late bloomer thing comes in for me. I wanted to be on camera as a, a commentator for football games, um, in professional sports when I graduated college. And I, back to being the geek and not having a self-confidence. I didn't think, I thought I was too fat. I thought I was not articulate enough. I thought my nose was too big. And I, I've always had this thing where I didn't think I was smart enough. Hmm. Um, cause I don't have great memory recall. I always get in trouble cause people are like, remember we talked about this? And I'll be like, no, I'm sorry. I don't, you know, obviously it doesn't happen all the time, mm -hmm. but, but I, I've held myself back for a really long time um, because who am I to be on the sidelines of an NFL game? Um, who, who wants to watch me? Right. You know, like who, why am I that important? And so I've sort of always, as I've been producing all this time in the back of my head, I'm thinking someone's going to just discover me. Like imposter syndrome. What's it called? Imposter syndrome. Never heard of it, but that yeah. makes perfect sense. You think what is not, it? It's um, where you think you're not supposed to be there in spaces that you're in because of the things. A lot of us have it. The things that you just talked about. I'm not smart enough and they're going to find me out. And I'm here like I'm an imposter pretending to be able to do the things that you're actually capable of doing. And you're there for a reason. But you just have this, you know, sim this, uh, idea that for some reason you're not supposed to be there and someone's going to find you out my whole life wow you know yeah but a lot of us totally. have it I mean even the most successful people and people as we're rising and especially as entrepreneurs because you're create I think this is part of my opinion because you're creating something and it's sort of like someone's going to find out that this isn't good enough or you know that I really don't know what I'm doing which a lot of times we don't we're kind of figuring it out as we go I never know what I'm doing. <laughs> One of the quotes that you said that, that you posted that I love was, we're all winging it. That's what angels do. And I was oh, going to yeah. ask you, in what ways are you winging it? So we're, yeah. we're all winging it. Yeah, we're all winging it. And um, the moment to answer your other question, the, you know, the moment or to finish what you're talking about, um, I, I, I've had, I've, I've, uh, it's so funny how slowly, because my brain moves so fast and in my head I want things to happen so quickly, but I've been so slow about putting myself out there as what I want to do. I've had my podcast for two years. Oh, okay? I didn't know that. I know. It's, <laughs> you've done like 50 million episodes in like five weeks and I've done like 16 in like two years, mm -hmm. right? I Everyone moved, at their own pace. I know, I know, I know. It, it is, it's just funny how you end up, <laughs> how different people end up creating things. And um, okay, that podcast started when a friend of mine said, I need a Levine intervention. And so actually I had the title first, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I helped her through something. And um, then I said, oh my God, that's a good title. And then I, I mean, I ever so slowly stepped into, well, how can I produce this? And I slowly got a producer and I got an engineer. And then I had an, I've always had an intern from Syracuse every summer so I got an intern and I, I, t I told the dean, I said, this is what I want the person to do. So over the course of the first summer, we, we made like three or four episodes. And then it took me like another six or eight months to do another three or four episodes. And so... Was that because of time? Because you were busy with other things or just you just girl, didn't get back to it? What, what, I, what was going on? I, I just don't put my own... I don't, I don't put myself first. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just don't, I put, I've put 
my TV projects, I, I just put everybody else first. It's just kind of part of my, my, my story and my work that I have to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, look, I make a paycheck from those jobs, so it's not like, you know, right. they're, so, they're a paycheck. But, um, yeah, it's, um, I still, look, I know there is a part of me that knows I am huge, that there is something. I've had a psychic tell me in the past, you're Oprah. And I was developing a show for him. So where I went in my head was, he just wants me to be as big as Oprah so that I can make him famous. Right. Right. So this is. This has always been, I've always been the guru to the gurus. Like who's attracted to me are major big gurus that feel my bigness. I've, I've always known that I, I, I'm big, but I've, I've, and I, to some people I'm living a huge life. To me, I know that how much power I have. I'm starting to know now how much power I have and how, how, much good that can do and how much pleasure it can bring me. That's right. A, that's another place you have to surrender to, right? It's funny how yes. that's another part of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, I know my level of my, my genius, my zone of genius is in, is interviewing people. I love interviewing people. I can tap. I have some like super high power to tap into other people's story and get them to tell it you do and I when I was on your show I I felt like sorry to interrupt you but I felt like that too I think I listened to it three or four times and not because of myself you know not that into myself but because I just loved our conversation and the questions that you asked and how it made me think and I literally thought about one I did the things that we talked about so I made my recording awesome I have that but also just considering the things that we talked about so you do definitely have this sort of gift of pulling things out of people and, and the platform or the premise of your show really fits your style and all of that. So thank you, Elaine. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's really fun for me too. Cause I like the play with mm-hmm. other people and I love seeing people have these moments where, you know, they can, they, the flip happens. Right. And so there's also part of me that feels like, I, I need to have my own talk show and I need to have my own network, you know, and, and so I feel like that's what I'm working towards at this point. And I don't judge the timing of it because I'm getting, you know, I'm getting older. Mm-hmm. I'm over 40. I'm well over 40. I, but I also feel like I have another like few good decades still to go. Right. And right. I don't I don't judge the timing of it. I'm as healthy as I've ever been. Um, and I'm hopeful and look, there's also, there's also a part of me like in this surrender goes like, girl, maybe you're not Oprah. You know, like I, I kind of, I, I, I go like, I also go like you, you're Oprah, right? <laughs> like you see it, you see the, I see bigness and everybody and everybody are my, are, are my teachers. Um, back to the guru part of it, but, um, I was developing a book for Mama Gina, she, Regina Tomashauer, right? And this woman leads literally hundreds of thousands of women on a revolution for pleasure. And she asked me to live with her. Hmm. And I did for a year and a half. Wow. Um, and she's a friend, you know, and almost every therapist or like I am friends, like I – helped with my last therapist, um, or coach, I'm going to say, do about her kids bat mitzvah. And like another coach I had in LA, I helped her, um, pitch her own pilot. Like I become collaborators with everybody. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. I think when you are living in a certain surrender and allowing that collaboration happens, you and I are doing it. Yeah. Right? That's like right. we went circular. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. Fully. It's like how can we and and what that is is it's mutual appreciation and mutual benefit and everybody growing. Right. And like that that's how we look at the world. And that that is what is so exciting to me about entrepreneurship and the relationships because I think like for me a job is you're paying me 
I'm going to come there, deliver something, and then go home, right? Like, it's a very clear path. Transactional, yeah. It's transactional. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship is, um, I'm moving my hands, like, in clouds, and, like, it's just, it's, like, constantly expanding into more and new, and you also have to learn how to, I, last year, I barely made any money. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm coming out of 12 months of very low cash flow. How did but, you, um, sorry to interrupt, how did you survive that time or not survive? How did you get through that time as far as not giving uh, up during that time? Because I feel like that's uh, something that we don't talk about enough either, that there are those hard periods. And trust me, I know where you're like, I don't know what's gonna, I just don't know. And then you have those moments of feeling like maybe I should just go back and get a nine to five or, and if people do that, that's fine. But how did you get through that period? Well, it's a great question, and actually, I'm really proud of this answer. I want to say that because I've spent a lot of time in down periods before panicking Mm -hmm. and grasping and looking for nine to fives and thinking I need to change courses. And this time, I I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you the creation part of it and the reality part of it. The reality part of it is that I had pl- I planned well. So that takes some thought before. I, I, I had a savings. Mm-hmm. Okay? I don't live above my means. I live within my means. And I always, I always have. That's very important to me. I think you have to be smart with your money. Mm-hmm. The day that I knew that I was going to have a dry spell, um, uh, or I, the, when I thought that this was coming, I went online and I opened a no interest credit card, a one year, no interest credit card. Hmm. And I had, um, a high limit on it. And what I did was I, I used it for the last 11 months. I mean, it's really amazing how this all worked out. I put on, but also I earned points. So I also, I also got stuff from it. Right. So for the last 11 months, I only take a little bit of cash out of my savings and then I put everything else on my credit card. And when I can, I pay it off out of my savings. I didn't want to go under a certain amount, Mm -hmm. spend a certain amount of my savings. So then when I hit that thing, I just kept putting the money on my credit card. But this was not me going out buying new clothes or taking trips. Um, I w- I did manage to do that over the last year because I was smart about other points and things like that, but I stripped down and, and so that's the reality of it was that I stripped down the fantasy and the creation of it was like, okay, so I'm not going to be out there in the world doing these things that cost a ton of money. What am I going to do? Oh my God, I turned in, I turned in and the most beautiful blessings have come to me. What do you mean you turned in? You just looked inward, you mean? I looked inward. I like really looked to myself for, um, I, I, I took the time to sink into the quiet. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. And what happened was I was offered a job teaching spin, like somebody, it was very roundabout how it happened. And I absolutely love doing that. I don't even call, I don't even, you could not, they, they, didn't, they wouldn't even have to pay me for that job, but don't tell them. Right. <laughs> right. Cause you I love, love it. it so much. Was that something you were already doing spin? I mean, and then, then someone approached yeah. you about it. Okay. Yep. It was. Yeah. But I mean, teaching, it's like a whole nother level. You have absolutely, you have to show up, like talk about being okay. So here's part of my journey, right? I'm not a football analyst. I'm not, I don't have my own talk show, but I am on with a microphone sweating on a spotlight in front of 45 people for 45 minutes leading them. They trust me, you know, they pay good money to come and I create music and I have to maintain my physical strength and my Mm -hmm. mental strength to do that. So I think that I was able to build that when I wasn't out 
making projects and making money. It became a different strength and a different currency for me. And I've also, yeah, man, I, I mean, I, I could go on about this forever, but I also, I, my relationships right now are so much deeper and so much stronger with the important people in my life that, um, I started doing, it gave me the time to do, to be careful and selective and thoughtful and very slow. It sounds about like it's, it what was I wanted a, to do a period that pushed you to slow down and kind of take things in a diff, at a different pace. That's what it Absolutely. sounds like. Absolutely. Yeah. And guess what happened? Uh, everything's already paid off of that credit card. The universe sent me the most amazing abundance. Um, I mean, it started dribbling in. I mean, there were times I hit the point. I hit the point where I said, oh, damn, I don't want to go into any more debt here. And damn, I don't have the cash. Like there was like one rent check where I had to come up with the, with the cash. And I just thought, now, look, I live in Tribeca. I drive a Mercedes. I went to Barcelona. I'm not living in, right. in poverty. Right, right. Right? <laughs> right? Like, let's be clear. Let's be clear. Like, I'm not, you know, this is my, I'm blessed enough to have created a world that is very safe and pleasurable, even if there's not a ton coming in, right? Like, I can survive in it for a while. I never had a poverty mentality when I wasn't making a ton of money this time. This time, I knew absolutely without a doubt it was going to be temporary. And I just completely surrendered into what was at the moment. And I said, just money's not my currency right now. There's some other currency happening mm. at the moment. And that abundance was just in another area. You know, like it was in relationship. It was in, it was in building the things that I love, like spinning and my nonprofit. I got to do two beautiful events and really focus on them and get the infrastructure there when I wasn't building my entrepreneurial projects, but they are entrepreneurial, right? Like it's all, right. it's all life. Life is all entrepreneurial. Right. I love that phrase. Money is not my currency right now. Cause it's another way of surrendering that tightness around. Of course we all, because of the society, the way it's set up, we all need money in one way or another or some kind of to be able to trade, but still this idea of that's not my currency. Where else do I have abundance in my life? Totally. You seem um, very, I just love, I mean, I, this is what I picked up from you before, but you're very in touch with this concept of surrender or in touch with this concept of flow and that kind of thing. When did that become um, a part of your life of just being, thinking about, for example, how the universe moves in different ways? Everyone's not in touch with that, um, or at least all the time, but you seem very conscious about that. When did that part of you develop? Um, thank you for asking that. It's yeah. always been part of what I wanted to be. Like that was why I would gravitate towards gurus and people who felt that. But I had a, I've had a hard time really accepting that because I'm sort of a type and, um, you know, I started allowing faith and trust into my life about five years ago and like trying to practice it small bites and I'm only going to say like within the last two years, have I found the right amount of support mm -hmm. to surround myself with people who believe this. So I was offered the opportunity to work with a trust coach who is amazing. Um, her name is Jaya. Um, I would love for people to check her out. Um, Jaya. Jaya, the trust coach is her website. J A Y A the trust coach. Okay. Um, she, I, I realized that one thing I didn't fully have in my life was learning how to trust myself, which of course then goes out to the universe and everybody. And so I've been working with her for the last year actually. Um, and she's absolutely helped me get, um, a, we were complete opposites. You know, she's like this earth mama who lives upstate in Ithaca and, you know, she's so soft and gentle. 
And of course, we ended up teaching a course together about dating mm. um, after we worked together for a year. This is my path. This is what happens. Um, but she Again, still... Again, you're collaborating with the guru. We're collaborating with the guru. <laughs> right. um, and so she helped me. And then I also... This is this was another financial decision I made, right? Like, I live in an apartment that I could afford, but I love the community feeling. And I rent out my second bedroom. And I pulled in a woman who lives completely, like, on another plane. Like, she... I don't even know how to start to explain Mary other than that she's, like... I live with an angel, Mm. who like just looks at the world in I grew up with parents that were very very much about reality like everything was was factual and happening right now and my both of my parents push against traffic and you know insurance policies and like just patriarchal infrastructure and now I've just learned to attract people that like yourself, you know, there's, there's just, there's other energies going on. Mm -hmm. You tap into a different kinds of energy. You just tap into it. And like, you know, look, there's plenty of things I would love. I would like to have a family. I would like to have my own talk show already. You know, I mean, there's things I would like to have a little bit of a brighter apartment. I would like to buy a house upstate. You know, there's things. Right. But in the surrender of, I have a podcast. I have beautiful friends. I have I have fun and I have gratitude every single day. You know, on my podcast, the last thing I do is what made you happy today? Because I think it's so important to appreciate everything that we have in this current moment. Mm-hmm. And then when you start doing that, you really start pulling in incredible people and relationships and it is a tough one to muster because you think you have to do, you really, you think you have, I think I have to do, like I'm a producer, I produce, I make things happen. But learning how to just like send out a little signal, you know, and then waiting for it to come back. It's like the biggest lesson of life, I think. I love it. Awesome. Now, what do you think the greatest lesson having a business has taught you about yourself as a woman? Well, it's funny that you asked that question that way. Because, um, um, there's so many ways to answer that question. Um, the old model of doing business is slightly masculine. And we've also been raised to depend on men. And what being an entrepreneur has taught me as a woman is the more I trust my inner guidance system and be myself, which is slightly outrageous, slightly, um, you know, I don't color in the lines. The more people have been coming to me, people want me for me right now. Like, and it's amazing to watch this unfold like when I remove myself from myself and I look at what's happening I'm going like oh my god wow like it's out there in the universe it's getting people are absorbing it um and it's really beautiful um to be able to lead from that place and trust that you're always safe and you're always protected somehow like even if it's by a no interest credit card I was just protected for a year I got through Mm-hmm. You know, and and knowing that that safety and that trust is available at all times means you can get out of bad marriages. You don't have to depend on somebody else to feed you or to take care of you. It's beautiful 
once you get to a place where you're safe and you trust and you love from yourself, I'm not saying we need to, I'm not saying at all we need to do this on our own because now I think the level of people and man and men I attract on a personal level and on a professional level. Like I used to pray. I used to pray. There was a time, I mean, yeah, this is also, this is a whole nother Oprah, but like my marriage was not healthy. I, I attracted a male who was domineering and controlling and did not want me to flourish. Hmm. How long were you married? Uh, we were together for 10 years. We were, we were married for three, but actually just yesterday, I finally got out of a financial arrangement with him where I was supporting him. Hmm. Just yesterday, it was a big, big, big day. I got, I, I finally had him buy his house back from me. Wow! Because I had been supporting him for a long time. Well, congratulations! It was big. Thank you. Yeah, it was part of becoming. Not being afraid of saying you have to take this back, you know. And I think that that's also what entrepreneurship is so important because we have to pave our own path. It's the only way to do it, and you have to you have to learn how to have the tough conversations and how to say things that people that put people to action and have them say yes to you at times. And so now it's like for me, it's been like clearing the decks, sort of of all the things that really don't serve me, and 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 maintaining these high level relationships and evolutions with people and relationships that serve everybody Mm -hmm. in the best way possible and sometimes it's still slow but um it feels a lot better what is your support network like I know you have coaches and different people that you seem to pull in but what would you say your your support network is like in your in your life and in your business um yeah I I've recently learned how to (laughs) find gurus in everybody. Mm -hmm. This is something that Jaya taught me, right? I'm going to, I'm going to give her full credit for this because I was, I was bumping heads with a few people in a few different ways on um, this project I'm on. And she's like, Abby, they're your gurus. I was like, Oh, whoa. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) That's true. And um, so that's sort of new to me, but I, I want to encourage people to think like that because, and not take things personally because it's true. Because what was happening was, yeah, people are there to teach you, and they really are reflecting their own their own things. And when you can when you can say okay, like you accept that that's just what's happening, then that's what you do. But I have a wonderful assistant who. We serve each other in beautiful ways. She's became the producer of my talk show. She she's laughs really hard because every day is so different for her. Like one day we're working on getting my nonprofit up and running, and the next day we're trying to figure out how to get my dog daycare, and then we're building a shelf here or there, and then we're booking talent for my private investigator show, and then we're like, you know we're doing she's always learning something new from me but mm-hmm. she's like really good at infrastructure how did you find her did you well any woman who is listening to this needs to find the sister goddess network the sister um, goddess network the sister goddesses it's it's regina thomas shower this is the mama gina oh. mama gina um a lot of the women that i know that that where have become my strongest relationships in my adult life is through Mama Gina's G E N A S Mama G E N A S, and um, there's Facebook groups and we've learned tools for how to live in pleasure, and it's an incredibly wonderful group of pe- women that gravitate towards this work, and we've all become very supportive of each other. Now my assistant and I are now you know it's a I pay her right. and she she does. But but it's bigger than that, too. You know, and so for me, it just feels really good to I don't always know what she's going to do during the day, but it works out. You know, it was like I took a little leap. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my support network is also. Yeah, I mean, I have coaches. Um, I have friends. Um, I, I have a dog, uh-huh. actually, who's also 
for me, very supportive. He's a protector and a great love for me. Um, I have a mentee. I mentor uh, a girl named Emily. Um, she's part of my support system too because she lets me – she doesn't know this directly, right? But <laughs> she lets me have the family that I want to have um, in the meantime. Mm-hmm. I have an ex-boyfriend who I say I moved over to my advisory board. Right. <laughs> um, so he's one of my gurus for sure. He's uh, he's very logical, and we're we're and so I so I call him. He ha- he has this whole other set of brain that I don't have. Like remember I said before, like I don't remember things well, and I'm not very like I'm not very logistic oriented. He's all that and more, and mm. so he he's also very forward thinking. I'm sometimes super in the moment. And so I count, yeah, so I find people, you know, like, look, we didn't work out as, as, as a couple, but I literally, I took him to therapy when we got divorced, when we got, we didn't want married, when we got separated, felt like we were married. And I say, I moved him onto my advisory board because he's really smart about many, many different things. And we enjoy that relationship now. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the relationships transform. They grow in different ways. I feel like that too. I have a lot of people that, different kinds of relationships, and now that's transitioned into a new area and you have to be okay with that. Yeah, Yeah, totally. Abby, thank you so much. This has been so fun. Um, I love getting to know you more and hearing just the way you think. It's fun too. Elaine, you're doing incredible work. I am so behind your movement. Support is sexy. Yes. And it's a really amazing cause to put in front of people to remind them all the time. And the content you're producing and your branding is just out of this world. So I want to wish you super good luck and let's keep talking. Thank you so much. I have a couple, just the last few things for you. Thank you for saying that. If you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person, whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Wow, you saved like the, the honker question for last. <laughs> that was like, okay, why don't you just drop the big can on me? Uh-huh. I'm going to tell you who came to mind. Um, <laughs> my uncle. My uncle who loved me so unconditionally when I came to Los Angeles. Um, he saw what I needed, which was to be carted around the city to look for work. And he put me up. I slept, his daughter slept on the floor and I slept in in his, in her bed when I first moved out there. And I don't talk about this too often, but I was anorexic at the time. I was really struggling with control, right? Mm -hmm. Because there were so many things out of control in my life. And he he loved me back to, he got me a therapist and he and his wife, like they almost like made fun of me in the most loving way. Like they would, they were like, well, we're all having burgers for dinner, Abby. They're like, here's your salad, (laughs) you know? And they really, they loved me unconditionally in every single way. And yeah, without them, I wouldn't have ever started my career in LA or healed or um had a place to go oh that's beautiful thank you for sharing that with us i know that's a very personal thing yeah sure now what's a fine the final question how can we support you what can we do go to your website i'll have uh levine intervention links to that and what and also tell us about how to find out more about your nonprofit. okay thank you yeah i would love that so the two things that um I'm involved in that I would love support on Yes, are, um, I have a podcast. Um, I do it twice a month live on an internet radio station and, um, it's called K piss. It's called K piss.fm. Um, there are episodes of my podcast, so you can go and listen to the episodes of my podcast on Levine intervention. NYC. They're also all available on iTunes and on Mixcloud. And I would love guests on the show. I would love just an onslaught of people that listen to your podcast desiring to come on and um, ask me a question because I am always curious and always looking for beautiful people that my listeners can learn from, Mm -hmm. um, that, that have a certain question that want to get answered. And so I do topics everywhere from like 
dating to sex to business to family to entrepreneurship and people ask one question and we spend an hour getting to know the person and taking them through the journey of answering that question. I love the concept. It's so good. Thank you. Now, how do Thank people, you. should people get in touch with you if they would like to see if they're a good fit for the show? What's the best way? Is it through the website or an email that you want to um, yeah, the, let's, um, they can go to the website, uh, levineintervention.nyc, but they can also email. If anybody listening is super compelled right off the bat to sit down on their computer and write an email, um, that can go to levineintervention at gmail.com. Okay. So it's L-E-V-I-N-E intervention at gmail.com. Okay, awesome. And then my nonprofit, my nonprofit is very special. Um, and people that get involved in it always thank me for the opportunity. I still sometimes think I'm overworking people or asking too much of people, but it's really fascinating what happens with this because everybody that volunteers comes back for more and asks when our next event is. My nonprofit was co-founded with a lovely friend of mine named Brenda Fredericks, and it is called Spread the Sparkle. It can... You can read all about us um, on spreadthesparkle.org. We host events on holidays for people that don't have anywhere else to celebrate that particular holiday. So we focus um, our efforts to be open and celebratory on holidays because most nonprofits are closed. So we have had three big events. We've had a Mother's Day event, we've had a Christmas event, and we've had an Easter event. All here in New York? So far. So far. But that is something I'm absolutely looking to do, which is expand the nonprofit internationally. And so right now I'm developing a, pro, a, a way to do that and reaching out to people to um, start this on their own in their own town. So right now I, I have somebody identified in Los Angeles and somebody in Tennessee. Um, and we have partnered with an organization called barrier free living. So our events are populated by women, kids, and men, um, who are disabled survivors of domestic violence. Mm. Um, so it is such a beautiful way to spend Christmas day to have, a beautiful brunch. Santa Claus come and give gifts to the kids. We have musical performances. We have photo booths. We get flowers and a beautiful brunch. We had um, a manicure and pedicure station at our Mother's Day event to pamper the moms. We had massages um, for all of the moms. And we really take care of people and celebrate them and give them a family. Mm-hmm. And a place that they can go on holidays. And all of our volunteers have just been so grateful to have the experience to share part of themselves with our populations um, on the holidays. Um, And so if people want to support us, we are, we're always raising money. (laughs) Um, We're always looking for volunteers also for our events. Um, And so the best thing to do for that is to go to spreadthesparkle.org. Spread the sparkle. I love the name of it. Spread the sparkle. Thank Beautiful. you. Girl. Awesome. Thank you, Elaine. I'll have links and everything on the show notes and also to the great people that you mentioned, like Jaya, the trust coach and all of that. It will be wonderful. So before you go, and again, I so appreciate you being here. You're wonderful. Oh. Do you have a, um, a parting piece of advice for us about anything? Oh, um, yeah, of course. I, have learned that chasing a good feeling and chasing abundance and chasing what's next is exhausting. And really believing that you're already creative, you're already abundant, you're already loved, you're already perfect exactly how you are helps expansion and is way easier than 
pushing hard, which is what we're taught a lot of the times. I had a, I made myself a New Year's resolution this year, which I don't actually believe in New Year's resolutions, but being the rebel I am, I broke my own rule. Mm-hmm. And I decided that this year was going to be easy for me, and everything was easy. So when I run into something that's difficult, I just remind myself, nope, it's easy. Easy. This is easy. You know, I don't actually have a flat tire on the side of the road right now. I have something else. Um, Everything is easy. So if you want to keep it short, keep it simple, that would be the parting advice. Just remember that everything is easy. Everything is easy. Abby, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Elaine. Super blessings. Yes, thank you. Hold on one second. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Support is Sexy podcast. And I do hope that you got some inspiration from it. And the challenge is for you to do at least one thing. Take one thing from the episode, at least one thing. You can always do more, but at least one thing that will help you move one step closer to your dream. Whether that's launching a business, writing a book, whatever that thing is that you want to do, take something from this episode and move one step closer. And what I'll also ask of you, if you can tell me what you think about the episodes, what we've been doing, what you want to hear what you like, what you experience while you're listening, go over to iTunes, leave us a review and let me know what's going on. What are you thinking? What are you feeling about the show? What else can I do to be of service to you, which is what this is all about, to be of support to you. That's our buzzword, right? You can also go to our website, supportissexypodcast.com. That's supportissexypodcast.com. Hear more episodes there. Also have a bunch of great videos, tons of information. It's where I'm going to be spending a lot of time and it's where I'd love to connect with you. So again, thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate you and your support. And the most important thing I want you to remember is having it all does not mean doing it all alone. So now go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.